Well, Brian and Luke, it is time to do the cleanup. And you know what that means. Not it. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh. The, the films that we were not necessarily enthusiastic enough to do in the first four parts of this. But we're going to do now. Uh, and there's there's some stuff that I did, actually. I am kind of a, a psyched to talk about. Let's We're going to go through these more quickly, though, because, like I said, we've already been here for a while. And shit. Yeah, kudos to you if you're still on board with us and you haven't tuned out. Well, you know, this is something they can listen to all month. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but the first thing is that they re-released the Mission Impossible movies, the first three in a Blu-ray set. Now, these are just the exact same films that we have seen in previous uh, editions that have been released. I mean, there's nothing really about them that stand out as different, except that Part 3, the one by J.J. J. Abrams, no longer has the bonus disc. So there are no bonus features on it So they've at taken all. bonus features away that were there previously. Now, I know what you're saying. Yes. Why would I even bother bringing this up? Other but than it's the, cheap. Other than the fact that Mission Impossible 4 just came out, and that movie made me so excited about Mission Impossible that I really wanted to give these three films a second chance. Sure. I am glad I did, but I'll get to that in a minute. The reason... This is good, is because it's twenty dollars yeah. for it's all a good, three, for three Blu-rays, Blu-rays yeah. and they're they're good transfers. So yeah. I mean, twenty dollars yeah. new. I yeah, mean, I'm sure you can find used copies for cheaper than that, and you know how Amazon and various sites like that are. Give it a month, and it will be even cheaper. You know, Definitely, that's it. Having just come out price, that's a hell of a good price for three pretty goddamn well transferred Blu-rays sure. uh, movies. And you know what? Having rewatched, I've never seen any of these movies more than once before, and all three in their original theatrical release. Oh, I've never okay. gone back and rewatched them. I'm gonna say this: I liked Part One a lot more the second time. <laughs> I did not care for it at all when I initially saw it. Really? Well, I was so mad that it wasn't a Mission Impossible film. Yeah, at that, all. That's. I think we're getting more into that, and I think the reason that that argument is cropping up again is because the fourth one is is totally a Mission is Impossible a Mission film. Impossible yeah. movie, and it highlights how poorly up to now they've been holding true to that that team dynamic that you know epitomized the show well three does get the team dynamic but not quite to the degree it should not to the degree yeah it's it's, like it's it makes concessions towards it it does a lot better about it but still too much of the time it's literally like look we have a team are you happy now great back to the tom cruise show yeah uh no but three gets a lot of credit for philip seymour hoffman is it oh three i know i don't think anyone's i don't think anyone's disparaging three i I think up until four three was the best one yeah, and I will say this as as much as that's true, and as much as J.J. J. Abrams wanted to make a film that was more of a gritty spy thriller and less had more of emotional content and less of a you know just big popcorn movie content, it it's kind of forgettable. Sadly, you know there are moments that are great. Philip Seymour Hoffman's great. Uh, it certainly makes up a lot of the ill will created by Mission Impossible 2, which is flat out a wow, fucking you know, terrible movie. Now that you mention that, I was I was going to argue with you, but I can't it's remember. Hard to remember it. Yeah. I can't remember a single goddamn sequence from the third one. You know, it's it, that's the problem with it. It is kind of forgettable. It is. As you're watching it, you're going, no, this is good. But then at the end, you're like, you know what? It's good, but that's all it is. It's and it's, good. it's not just a recency effect. Like It's not just because I just saw the fourth one. I can remember a lot of sequences from the first two. Yeah. I can't remember sequences from the third one and, and i don't want that to to tell people not to watch it because i think you will no, the third no it's it's, it's good but it. um, shit <laughs> that's kind of freaking me out it was like i said the only good thing in two is thandy newton's cleavage that's it that's the only positive oh, thing i just, have to say about that oh, two is so over the top all right Every 30 seconds, someone is wearing one of those masks where it turns out there's someone else. There is even a sequence in 2 where a character is wearing a mask for somebody, and he has a flashback for that character, (laughs) and then takes his mask off and reveals that it's actually the other guy, except that doesn't make any sense, because we just watched him have a flashback for the character he was wearing the mask of! That doesn't make any sense! Wow, I had (laughs) forgot about that, but that sounds awesome. Oh my god. John Woo... We love you. Kindly stay in Hong Kong and make movies there for the rest of like, your life. The sequence where Tom Cruise has just blown the door off the hinges with a big exp- uh, with a grenade, and he walks by the door in slow motion right after a glowing dove flies oh, through the God. door. Yeah. Glowing dove, yeah. mind you. Not just a regular dove, oh, but a yeah. special variety that only happens in John Woo's films. Uh, no, that is terrible. Part one is actually pretty watchable if you can get past the fact that it is not, in fact, a mission. I think, part. here's the thing. I think if they're judged based on... Uh, just film. I think that four and one are kind of equal in my estimation of the best one. If you're judging them based on action films, 
I don't think you, there's any question that four is the best one. Shit, I don't think if you're judging action films, I can't think of anything in the last couple of years that comes close to Mission Impossible Four. It's but, unreal. Yeah, I think I, Casino Royale is the last the last one that I'm like, all right, Casino Royale. Because of that, Mission yeah, Impossible no, that's a, that's a good argument because mm-hmm. there was that whole free running thing that really blew Casino Royale is amazing. I yeah. think it's an action film, but. The thing about Mission Impossible 4 is that I haven't seen audiences recoil like that in horror movies in the last however many years that they were doing a Mission Impossible 4 to the action sequences because they were so, so, the the stakes were up so much that it was just, like, you were biting your nails and, like, and the, chewing your armrest. The, the sequence, the, I mean, the, the sequence, the sequence with Tom Cruise on the Burj Khalifa in Dubai is just incredibly oh, filled. If you, oh, once incredibly again, I know filled. it's been said all over the site, but if you haven't seen it yet... And you're thinking, should I bother seeing it in IMAX? The answer yes, is dear God. Because Even if it's a fake IMAX. Yeah, you will get vertigo watching that sequence. No question. You will. Your stomach will be in your throat. Definitely. And just as a pure fan of cinematography, you'll sit there in awe. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's fantastic. Anyways, it's so, to me, like on all levels, it's the best of the films. But, you know, what? like I said, one isn't as bad as I remember. I'm not a big Brian De Palma fan. I know. <gasps> But I'm just Fuck not. You. I I liked him when he was I'm a kid, kidding. and now watching his films, going back and rewatching him, I go, wow, this guy is kind of a hack, actually. It's like he wants to be Hitchcock, he wants Cyrus. to be Hitchcock, and he's not even close to being Hitchcock. I just don't. I'm going to brain you. I'm sorry. Oh. I still like. Uh, I was with you when you said you weren't his biggest fan, but when you called him a hack, I almost no, leapt I said, across the room and strangled I you. I said kind of a hack. <laughs> well, I kind of almost Look, killed you. Go watch Rear Window, and then watch Body Double. Uh, yes, and tell I'm, me if you don't feel a little nauseous I, afterwards. I, I am aware that he is 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 copying generously <laughs> from Hitchcock, Heavily. but I think he does it in. This is not a Brian De Palma debate. It's not. So let's move on to the next title, which is Underbelly. <laughs> yeah, which we, is we can Aust- talk about blowouts some other time. Which is an Australian television series based on a real series of, of killings in Melbourne. Uh, that took place between 1995 and 2004. Now, this was an, th- one of the most popular TV series from Australia e- ever. And I know what you're saying. They have TV in Australia? Sure they do. Now. <laughs> wow. We just lost all of our Australian listeners. Sorry I'm, to both of you. I'm kidding to my friends who come to the dot .com. You know who you are. But um, I really, really, really enjoyed the shit out of this show. It's a... For anyone who enjoys like Goodfellas and that sort of stuff, or gangster type films, this is a phenomenally well done series in the vein of The Sopranos, except they don't just sit around watching TV and having dinner for a lot of the time. Uh, it's very violent, it's got lots of sex, it's got an amazing acting and story as you watch this, these guys, the story that plays out following all these criminals, uh, initially this one character who is a complete psycho, and you're like, uh, Alphonse Gangitano, who was called the Black Prince of Ligon Street. And you think, oh, well, obviously this guy's going to be the star of this whole thing. But you know what? He's totally not early on. And as the film goes, different people die off, new characters come in. And eventually, the least likely person that you would guess to be one of the most hideous serial killers and monsters in Australian crime history in the series is you know ends up being that guy you're like wow this little tiny runt like rat faced fink dude was like one of the most evil people who ever lived wow i clearly did not watch enough of this it's it's a really great show i watched about half of the first season i did not get to finish it yet and the set that they put out on dvd is three seasons the second two being prequels in fact there's a fourth season airing currently that takes place in the 1920s oh wow like with our early crime family the both of the i think one of the previous ones the first previous series was in the 70s the second one's like between 88 and 89 when it took place but uh they've all been really highly regarded this is i I don't want to tell you this is so well worth anybody's time who likes I think it is stuff. I think it is an investment though like I think if the more you watch it the more you're going to get from it and it's this set especially being so expansive you're really going to want to commit to it well, in order to. to get the full benefit of it cuz I to be completely honest I watched the first episode and I thought it was just fine but that is as excited as I got about it but it seems like from what you were saying as it goes along it gets a lot better. That's what I'm saying, too. It has yeah, titties. Is, it, does it does have, have titties. titties. It has a lot so, of titties. If you're a fan of titties, which I think we all are. It, it <laughs> does not have, like, a knock-it-out-of-the-park pilot. I agree. Yeah. I mean, it's not bad. You're like, yeah, that was all right. 
But as it goes along, you start seeing how it's different from other shows. And right. The different direct the the chances it takes, and yeah, you really do get worked up into it. I can totally see why it was as popular, why it still is as popular as it is in Australia. Cool. It deserves to be seen wider. But you guys haven't watched it at length, so we're just gonna move on. Like I said, we're supposed to be moving through stuff. And that you was know, Underbelly. That was Underbelly, and like I said, my opinion, well worth your time if you're a TV fan and you like crime stuff. Uh, let's talk about Kino Lober. Ah, yes. Kino Lober is a film company that's been releasing stuff on Blu-ray that they like to release stuff that is very early. Yes. Like, like Criterion does really good copies of stuff that goes all across the board, right? But art and like obscure stuff that is considered by film fans to be masterpieces to some, some degree or another. Uh, but you never know what... Air- Error they're going to pick from. Kino Lover likes to pick from the very beginnings of film, as evidenced by some of the stuff that they put out this month. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of the stuff is actually from before this month, but we just got it. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about it. You'll have it to anyway. forgive us a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but for instance, they just put out their yet another version of Metropolis, which is, of course, this is the Fritz Lang film. What's different about this version, although they do have the all right, so a lot of people don't know this, but Metropolis in its complete version didn't even exist until a few years ago. Right. Somebody found a complete version in a vault, and I, I actually I think it was Australia once again, uh, but they found a, a complete version 35 minutes longer than the previous version. And that is the complete Metropolis, also available for Kino Lober. It's a pretty amazing story. If you, if you have the time, you should definitely uh, wiki it and, and read the whole story. There's a huge history behind the various restorations that have taken place that are actually pretty interesting. This is from a 1984 version, which was the first modern restoration, like really thorough restoration of it. But what's odd about it and controversial is that it was by this uh, director... I uh, didn't have his information right here. Hold on, let me pull that up. It was by this uh, uh, creator who decided that he was going to speed it up, tint its color, yeah. um, change the title cards, because it's a silent film, to subtitles, mm-hmm. and soundtrack the whole thing by modern 80s artists like Queen and people Giorgio like Moroder yeah, was yeah, it? Giorgio, Giorgio Moroder. Moroder. Uh, and he, Thank he you. also composed some of the music. Now, it was very well. controversial, but it was also quite important, because like I said, a lot of people hadn't seen a, a fixed up version of this film at all and it was the first film that narratively first version of it that narratively made sense yeah where they had put it together and there was enough new footage they had discovered that they could tell it a plot because in the older versions it was literally like you would reach points and it would just go to a screen that said and then you know this character goes here and sees this and yeah. then it would jump 20 minutes ahead in the movie because that footage just didn't exist it didn't exist and some of it was presumed like they yeah. didn't even know for sure what happened they were ba- some they were basing some of it on pieces of the script and then they would just have to kind of fill in the blanks based right. on assumption so suffice it to say this version it's a it's one interpretation but you might find this interesting there's it, it certainly has some historical value to it mm-hmm. um maybe it's the most fun version to watch in that sense and certainly the original version is is a lot longer this is significantly sped up and that's maybe not necessarily a bad thing <laughs> no but for a film purist i can see why that might irritate you it's an alternate version of the film to own if you really want to have the ultimate true to life version of it you want the complete metropolis which came out earlier the, which kino lorber well, also put which out they also put out yeah uh another film by them uh well there's two discs that came out that are in their buster <laughs> keaton collection and they're getting right to the end of the buster keaton collection as far as the independent stuff they've released all but i think one of the pre-mgm stuff from him yeah. which is basically all the good stuff which by the way if you're not familiar with buster keaton uh just incredible Get incredible familiar. performance i i is jackie chan's hero he really he his physical comedy like take away the fact that these were made so many years ago just watching if you were to watch somebody do that today it would be impressive, impressive. yeah no 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 i mean and people still don't know how they did a lot of the stuff that he did it's it's really i mean watch it, something like sherlock junior and you'll understand what we mean there are yeah. sequences in that that today you will blow your mind yeah, he, Absolutely. Is, he is arguably the most influential stuntman of all time to the point that he was a star in his own right. He had his own series of movies, like we said. Sherlock Jr., probably my favorite, hard to say. There's the... Uh, the General. The General, thank you. Generally uh, considered to be but one of his best. Honestly, <laughs> almost anything by him in, like I said, the pre-MGM phase is really worth watching. All his independent stuff. And these are... There's one that has Go West and Battling Butler. Go West is 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 uh, Buster Keaton trying to be a rich guy. Uh, or No, I'm sorry. He's a guy trying to be a cowboy who's dropped off in Arizona when he falls off a train. And all the type of humor you'd expect from an incompetent guy who's no good at being a cowboy, trying to be a cowboy. <laughs> Battling Butler is a little more unusual where he's a spoiled rich kid 
who falls in love with a country girl and has to, to, to get the approval of her disapproving mountain parents, don't ask, <laughs> to pretend to be an up-and-coming new boxer. Uh, once again, I don't know why that would happen. <laughs> Uh, uh, but yeah, it ends up this little tiny guy having to fight this huge guy. Yada yada. Martin it's like Sc- the end of Punch Out. Ex- on it is NES. just like that. <laughs> Martin Scorsese has actually claimed it. it was one of the big influences for him when he made Raging Bull. Oh like, shit! Yeah, believe it or not. Wow. How crazy is that? Uh, and it comes with lots and lots of extras on these discs. There's also, I believe, the one that you got was Seven Chances. Yes. Okay. Now Seven Chances was was an odd film that it was actually generally considered to be a pretty goddamn good film, but Keaton hated it because he was forced into doing it. It was a failed Broadway play that his producer, who was kind of a shyster, I guess, bought the rights to it and said, no, you've got to do this. And so it was one of those things where he was like, this is a terrible story. I mean, it's The Bachelor. (coughs) You ever saw that movie, The Bachelor with Chris O'Donnell? And Renee Zellweger, where no. the guys can't inf- get the huge for money, the huge fortune, unless he marries I w- somebody. I will say I'm familiar with the story. I've never, f- no, no, I haven't seen. Well, this movie I, I had to see it. And <laughs> I'm a lesser. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm a lesser person for it. Uh, but and the seven chances are in this, where there's seven bachelorettes that he has to go through to try and find one that'll marry him. And it's very silly. It's a seven stu- brides for one brother. Pretty much. Okay. It's a really stupid plot, but he makes up for it by doing some of the craziest stunts that he did in his career. Right. So worth watching for just watching him just go like, there's nothing here. We've got to come up with another stunt sequence because there's nothing here. Yeah. And honestly, that's what we're watching at this point, a day and age these films for is to do it, see him do crazy shit. Right. He was never the actor that Charlie Chaplin was, but as a physical performer, he's one of the best guys who ever lived. Absolutely. So, hands down. Uh, there is that. And that was the Buster Keaton set, Go West and Battling Butler, as well as Seven Chances. Yes, it was. Now, uh, um, they also put out, and I know, I know, Leon so wanted to be here to talk about this, but Birth of the Nation, which is uh, <laughs> DW. He actually did. He really did want to be here to talk about this because he's like, you know, this is a film that there's so much to say because it's one. Cons- you can't take a history of film class without being made to watch Birth of the Nation. I mean, it's one of the most important movies ever made it really is and it's also makes heroes out of the Ku Klux Klan it's a little bit racist <laughs> it's a little it's a to say it's a little bit racist is like it's to say Michael Richards is a little bit racist <laughs> um it really it, it's it's totally unfair to this movie to not give it the credit it's due though despite that I mean for Christ's sakes and the director, D.W. Griffith, who like a lot of people consider to be maybe the most important guy in the history of film for all the innovations he brought to it. Mm-hmm. I mean, he did so much stuff, like for the first time in this and then his next film, Intolerance, which was, by the way, his apology for the racism in this film. <laughs> <laughs> As was several other movies he made later, which he felt so bad about like realizing kind of what he'd done, I suppose. I haven't read a biography or anything, but that is right. what I've gotten from it. Uh, it's a movie that's important to make, and I, I hate to say that because it's over three hours long, and already I can feel everyone a- a- yawning. It's important to see. It's part of the. It's part of our film history, man. As it is, I mean, uh, Ro- all right. Here's I'm going to end this with this. Roger Ebert said, "The Birth of a Nation is not a bad film because it argues for evil. Like Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will, it's a great film that argues for evil. To understand how it does so is to learn a great deal about film and and even something about evil. And I think that totally nails wow. this film. It really does. Uh, it, it is important if you really care about the history of film, you should see it. And and Kino Lober. They put in, they spared no expense at putting the set together. It's a it's a gorgeous three it's a really nice set. set up here. Uh, I mean, there's so many extra features. All of his Civil War shorts that he made at the time wow. are on here, which he was very much into. Uh, there's there's just so much. There's interviews with him. You know, God, how mm. would they have to? How much <laughs> did they have to dig to come up with those? You know, Holy um, shit, yeah, man. totally, totally, totally worth watching. Now. Kino Lober doesn't always do old stuff. They also do some new stuff as well, or newish stuff. Uh, and I'm gonna we're gonna skip one of the other ones. This French film called Wrapped because there's just not enough time to go into it. Sure. Uh, although I do recommend it. I, I yeah, we'll just skip that and go to City. That's R A P T Wrapped. Wrapped, not like R A P P E D. Yeah, I'm not sure it even that's what it actually spells, but it, that's the name of the film. Uh, but a City and Life and Death was a film. Uh, that came out in 2009, a Chinese film that's about the rape of Nanking. And by that we mean they literally <laughs> raped the entire city. Yeah, we're not being figurative. Like, they didn't they didn't soil their culture, or they didn't, you know, do something 
that made them look bad. They they literally raped an entire fucking city. And, and this took place during the Second Sino-Japanese War, which ended ended when Jap- Japan was bombed by America at World War Two in 1945. Uh, it, it it was going on before World War Two started between China and Japan, as Japan was aggressively and not for the first time trying to invade and take over China. These guys have never historically really gotten along all that well. If you uh, watch any of Donnie Yen's movies from the last couple of years, you'll get the you same get, story. you get the idea. <laughs> but it, they, Nanking was the capital of China, and Japan stepped in there, killed, according to China's estimates, and of course Japan has a different accounting, says there were 300,000 deaths and twenty to 80,000 rapes of men, women, and children. Now this film, which is an astonishingly well-made film, I mean, cinematography is jaw-dropping. I mean, I gotta tell you, I don't know how you guys felt about this, or even if you got to see this, but I thought this was incredible. I mean, one of those movies that, like Schindler's List, you just have to see and be alone with with your thoughts for a while after you watch it. I, I, I mean, I know it's not glorifying it by any stretch of the imagination, but it is interesting for us to kind of follow up a conversation about Birth of a Nation and about how it's an important film it's speaking about evil because this is kind of a similar situation. It's like this is a beautifully made film and it is important, but it's going to be hard to watch because there's a lot of evil in this movie. Except that the birth of the nation is glorifying that. That's evil. what I'm saying. They're not glorifying it in this, yeah. but it's still kind of an interesting bridge between the two discussions. And it's... Uh... It is really difficult to watch, not in a sense of, of like, you know, the beauty behind the lens. That's gorgeous. It's a very well-told story. But as it goes along, it just gets darker and darker until you're, you're at points where you go, well, at least that's as dark as it's going to get. Oh, no, you nope. haven't seen the part where they start the rape machine going <laughs> as they just bring in loads of new women to get raped until they die from being raped too much and then bring the next load in. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> man. Uh, um, you know I need what? to shower just talking about this. If this was like a film that was fictional, I would go, well, that's tasteless and uncalled for. But this is actually what really happened. And it's a story that needs to be told for that reason. Yeah. And it's done, despite what it sounds like, what I just said, very tastefully. Uh, extremely well done. I would call this a must-see film. And I am, I, I'm, I'm actually grateful to Kino Lober for putting it out. There, yep. I said it. I'm going to get over, Clem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kino Lorber. So you did see this. Uh, I saw uh, the vast majority of it. I actually had to turn it off. Uh, it was too much? It was too... That's, that's one of my buttons. I'm not... I am not. I mean, we can joke, but, like, I can't watch... I can't watch rape in movies. And I... If there is, like, one or two scenes where it's, you know, integral to the story, not that any of this wasn't, yeah. but it's like, it got to the point where I just... I could, there was so much yeah. that I couldn't... And that's not... I'm not disparaging the film whatsoever as cyrus said it's a story that needs to be told it's but it's so heavy couldn't couldn't get through it couldn't do it it's extremely disturbing yeah there's no question about it i wouldn't even go so far as to say it's necessarily graphic per se it no it's well i mean there's a lot of nudity but it's no no it's not that it's just it it has emotional resonance yeah a lot of it how can you not be affected by this and i think that's exactly their point they want you to be and it never feels manipulative it's almost fly on the wall in the sense of that it's just saying what happened exactly and that's i mean it's the same reason i, I walked out of uh girl next door which was directed by um uh, gregory wilson gregory wilson with the comedy no 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 no, 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 no. no, no. the the one about the uh the girl that was being it was played fantastic fest a few years ago oh i don't know i must have missed it that. was it, it was, was basically uh, yeah what was the it? same it's the sylvia likens case uh which is a uh <laughs> a court case from Indiana in the mid '60s, I believe, um, and essentially what happened were what was that uh, two girls, uh, sisters, their parents had to leave for the summer for some reason. I mean, again, this was the '60s when people were a lot more trusting, but essentially her parents had to leave for the summer for some reason, so they left their daughters with a neighbor who, for whatever reason decided that it was okay to rape and abuse them and and invite like neighborhood boys neighborhood children over to rape jesus christ it was it was incredibly awful and in similar situation it is a a horrible story and has it actually has a a message to it and it is a story that needed to be told but i had to leave i was like no i can't can't do it i there are two films that, that have been made based off of that uh the girl next door by gregory wilson which played fantastic fest and a movie called uh, An American Crime, 
uh, starring Ellen Page, which played Sundance, I believe. Um, and I, ha- I haven't seen that film, but Gregory Wilson's film is heartbreaking and jaw dropping and incredible in the way that it deals with really, really difficult material involving children. And, you know, it's one of those films that you, you don't like necessarily <laughs> and you don't recommend, um, but you respect and sure. But know. it was the same situation for me where it's like, I understand this is a story that needs to be told. I don't fault the filmmaker at all. But I need to get out of here. Well, no, I understand that. <laughs> and there are films that are okay that are that way. I know people who've never been able to get through a Clockwork Orange for the exact same reason. There's a really incredibly disturbing rape sequence in that movie that's super famous. But there's I know lots of people who've never watched that film past that point mm-hmm. because they go, no, I'm sorry, I, I just I started crying. I couldn't deal with it. It was too much. It's too horrible. But it, they're trying to make us come to terms with this. This shit happens. Yeah, you know, and if you're talking about it in not an exploitative way, but in a, a, a way of like reminding us that it's important to understand that of how evil we're capable of being, those who do not remember history, doomed to repeat it. Yeah. Anyway, so that's a Kino Lorber discussion. Let's talk about something a little more light, which is Mystery Science Theater. Oh, thank God. Volume twenty two. Woohoo! Now that Shout Factory has taken it over. And and good lord, they've done a fantastic job. I am so so happy that they that Shout Factory took it over because they as soon as they got their first set, the the improvement was was staggering. Oh, oh, right off the bat, I mean Rhino did just fine, but they did the minimum amount of damage. they they did yeah as little as as possible. Nice nice uh, box design. I it was nice that. of them to put them out. Yeah, basically is the reason we don't we don't shit on them because without them. We wouldn't have been able to get them at all. But Shout Factory puts out little mini flyers that come with it with original artwork for each of the movies. They do mm-hmm. brand new bonus features that they put Animated together. menus. They do, like, some of the box sets have, like, figurines of the characters. Like, they're really going all out. And they're pretty good about mixing them up, too, with the different uh, films. With like, some Mike and some Joel. Some Mike and some Joel. Yeah. Two different guys who, along the way, have been the human in the <laughs> spaceship of love. Or the satellite of love. The satellite of love. love the uh, SOL. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Living with the robots, Crow and Tom Servo, as they're forced to review bad movies by Dr. Forrester or later Pearl Forrester on Earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, this set we get uh, the two Joels are Time of the Apes and Mighty Jack, which are both the Sandy Frank, uh, Sandy Frank. producers version of television shows in Japan that he basically cut apart and made into barely comprehensible. Yeah, like 20 years after they were released on Japanese TV, he bought them and turned them into movies. And the funniest part about that is you watch these incredibly like modern to the late 80s title sequences yeah. and then movies that were clearly made in the 60s. Yeah. And it's like, wait, what? And they're so ridiculous and terrible that I'm kind of glad he did it. Yeah, thank you, Sandy Frank. I, well, it's funny. There's an extra on here where they're talking to like a historian about um, specifically Mighty Jack, which apparently was a very well received show in Japan. But the guy is like, "Look, this is from. The, I never understood why Sandy Frank chose to do this from the first series because the first series is a very serious spy thriller, mm-hmm. and the second series where they went, this is dumb. Let's just make this into more of a pop comedy type of thing and be really goofy. So he's like, the second series is great. First series is kind of shit. Why, <laughs> you know, it's like the way to see it is with robots in front of it. And sure enough, whereas Time of the Apes is a just." <laughs> It's a Planet of the Apes remake. It is one of the worst rip-off. rip-offs of Planet of the Apes I think I've ever seen. And it demands to be seen for that. Yeah, and there's an Italian rip-off uh, called like Revenge from Planet Ape, which is not as bad as Time of the Apes. Now, the other two are The Brute Man, which was the last Rondo Hatton film, who mm-hmm. was just, I forget the name of the disease he had, but uh, it, he was... Uh, he had a physical deformity that made him like his bones kept growing basically in fact if you've seen the rocketeer which we'll talk about in a minute uh the character in there of lothar was specifically based on his on rondo Rondo hatton's performance and appearance in this film and he is he's really distinctive looking it's one of the reasons that universal totally buried this movie because they were getting so many accusations of exploiting his deformity because he Mm -hmm. died of it before it even came out um, the other film in here with with uh, Mike is uh, uh, The Violent Years, which is the most successful Ed Wood film, although yeah. not directed by Ed Wood. He did, in fact, write it, and it's another, it's a teenagers in trouble, rebellious teenagers. Type. Pseudo-pornographic teenagers yeah. in trouble. Just But it comes uh, with the, one of the best shorts ever. Which, oh, yeah. Which is, uh, what is it, the youth of... 
something. God, what do they call that? Like, shit. I, I'm blanking out. Oh, I'm sorry. I totally forgot right now, but I didn't write that down. But here's the thing about it. It's a promotion for electricity. And I'm yeah. not kidding. It's a promotional film for how awesome mm-hmm. electricity is. And it seems like the, what, the 50s <laughs> or whenever it was made is a little too late for that. Yeah, like, it's... you have electricity already, you realize, right? And it's like, no, no, look at our all electric Yes, action. that's that's exactly what it, okay. Yeah, I remember now. It's like, the the son uh, is bringing, like, his friend over, and the daughter's, like, all smitten, so she wants to make him a great dinner to impress him. And he's so clearly gay, I'm and sorry. And he's super gay. Oh, my God. But then, then you realize, it's not until, like... Ten minutes into the short that you realize that it's just an advertisement for electric appliances. Yeah, yeah. And, oh my and, god, I remember it come screaming back to me now that you said it, electricity. It's one of their best shorts ever. The other uh, the other one, uh, The Brute Man, comes with The Chicken of Tomorrow, which is also one of their other great It's so awkward ever. to watch that. <laughs> uh, this is one of their best sets that Shout Factory's put out, actually. I would agree with that. All four of these are super, super fun. Um, I, I mean, I can't say enough good things about uh, Mighty Jack in particular as yeah. far as how much I enjoyed ver- watching their version of this. Um, they, I, I, I don't want to tell you. They're, they're great. Oh, and one little fact about Sandy Frank you might not know. Do you know what he does now? He's working with the Asylum. Oh, <laughs> I should yes. have known. <laughs> yes. I don't know how I didn't guess Y-E-S. that. Y-E-S. <laughs> they don't know. They are the guys who do the, like, transmorphers and, like, all They those. take whatever movie is popular at the time make a movie that's very similar with an almost identical title so they don't get sued and try and trick you into renting it. Yup. And You're one... damn right they do and they bring back 80s pop stars. Yup. Well, what? one thing I do want to mention about this set, one special feature in particular, is a making of television uh, special that was on the Sci-Fi Channel right yes. after they moved over. And, it, I mean, it's, it's a made-for-TV, like, behind-the-scenes thing, but... What's really interesting about it is we actually get to see inside their writer's room. We get to see the props department, which is responsible for the the crazy aesthetic of the ship. Like, to date, it is the most that we've ever had of a Mystery Science Theater behind-the-scenes documentary. Really. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, it may be the only one that I'm aware of. And it, you'll have to correct me if I've missed this, but the one feature that I'm still looking for is they did an Oscar show. Yeah. One not, year. Not that I've seen yet. And so. I think it was the year that Titanic was up for Best Picture. Right. Uh, and they they trashed all of the Best Picture nominees, and it was so goddamn funny. If they're not, if that's not available, it's probably because they can't get the rights to the footage of the stuff. Probably so. not. But I I'm praying for the day that Shout Factory is able to include that as a special feature on one of their releases. Uh, all right. So moving on, and we just talked about this, uh, the Rocketeer. Now, Luke. Woo-hoo! Woo-hoo! Uh, I, I know, love the they Rocketeer. They finally put this out on Blu-ray, I much know. to the happiness of so many people who love this film to death. This this Disney 1991 period superhero adventure film made by uh, Joe based, Johnson, made by Joe Johnson, who just did Captain America. In fact, which was another great. In fact, this so got really him the Captain America. This deal. is the movie that he didn't know he was using as an audition to do Captain America. Well, exactly, and one of which the is reasons, good because it worked out well. Well, yes. despite the fact this was critically well received, it didn't perform well, and a lot of has been made of discussion of that. And the reasoning is generally given. And I'll tell you right now, the reason I didn't go see it because, like, I don't really want to go see a Disney superhero movie. And that's the largest argument they went. Audience, which is like, funny because now Disney owns Marvel. <laughs> I know, I know. But at the time, it was like really. So it's going to be a really kiddie friendly superhero movie that just doesn't sound terribly appealing. And then so, it turned out it really wasn't. Audiences stayed away in droves. It was it was dark, and there was like like Nazi conspirators in America in Hollywood, and there was like people getting killed and broken in half, and like there is a lot of adult shit in this movie. <laughs> Um, I really love the fact that uh, you've got uh, Terry O'Quinn as Howard Hughes. I think that's yeah. hysterical. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, he's... I wanted to see a spinoff just about him having his own adventures. That <laughs> really. would be awesome. Uh, and but, they originally were supposed to have sequels, but like I said, it didn't really sell. I will say this. Um, uh, all right, so this was at the same time as... Uh, what's his name? Who was playing the villain. Was, Timothy uh, Dalton. Yeah, Timothy Dalton was playing, just starting to get playing James Bond, which I still think is was a bad this idea. Was, this was actually uh, after... Well, no, he was already James Bond. But. Right, he was. It was in the interim between him being James Bond and there not being James Bond movies oh, for six he was, years. He, I think there was one out after. No, no, was, he did one in '87, and then he did one in '89, and that was it. Okay, and this you're, was '90. You're geekier than I am. I, I dude, like, Bond is one of my things. Bond is. Uh, All right, fair <laughs> enough. But I've always thought Timothy Dalton is a terrible choice to play a good guy. Period, except maybe yeah, in Flash oh, definitely. Gordon. The only exception. Which, even in Flash Gordon, he's not he's an completely anti-hero. good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and just look at the man's face. You don't trust him. No, he's a, he's a mustache-twirling bad guy here. What he's playing is Errol Flynn. Mm-hmm. Because at the time, there was a biography of Errol Flynn out that claimed that Errol Flynn was a Nazi spy. And it wasn't 
until a few years after this came out that it was disproved. Yeah. That, that was like all a bunch of bullshit that the author, in fact, fake documents, yada yada. But at the time, this was playing off that. Mm-hmm. So it was clear his character is supposed to his be. His character, who is a movie star, a swashbuckling movie star, who yeah. is a Nazi conspirator. Yeah. Mm, shocking. <laughs> uh, but Billy Campbell does a great job as the Rocketeer. It's a shame that his career went. I'm like, where the fuck did that yeah, guy go? He went yeah. nowhere, unfortunately. Uh, but Jennifer Connelly is gorgeous. Oh, She's so gorgeous here, yeah, but the biggest complaint is... Alright, so the original creator, Dave Stevens, who wrote this comic, is really a tribute to Golden Age stuff. A lot of people think it actually was a Golden Age book, and it wasn't. It was a much later day thing in the 80s. Uh, he was a huge Betty Page fan. The, the classic mm-hmm. uh, kinky pinup pin up model. And the girlfriend of the Rocketeer in the series was a nude model met, modeled after... Betty Page. I mean, nice. she was clearly supposed to be Betty Page. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, he ended up becoming really close friends with Betty Page in real life and in fact, paid for her to have lawyers to win back legal rights to her likeness. Nice. Yeah, they have very a very cool. touching, there's a very touching story that I hope someone makes a movie about alone, about their friendship. Huh. But, my one complaint here is that they chose not to go with the Betty Page look for Jennifer Connelly because, oh my God, can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I'll be imagining for several minutes later. Yeah, I, I can imagine uh, uh, you know, ten-year-old me having a lot of fun with that VHS. <laughs> Here, here's a funny thing about Jennifer Connelly in this movie, and I wish I was making this up because it sounds like I'm making it up. Her character's name was originally not Jenny. Yeah. But <laughs> she had a. I, God, this is gonna sound made up. She had a problem on set with people calling her something other than her actual name. Really? Yeah. Like they had so many problems, they changed the character's name. It should to be noted, Jenny. not not like a diva problem, but like no, a like memory. A, like she issue. couldn't she couldn't separate herself from her own name. Well, she was all right, so she had already she was very in, young. She had already been in Labyrinth. She probably had a certain amount of celebrity about that. Certainly, she had already been that, in Phenomenal. I certainly knew that I was paying attention to her after Labyrinth. Yeah, in well. multiple ways, I probably were inappropriate. And man in that she was dress. probably just discovering weed at that point. So, and this know? is a story from and the set. Dick. It could be it could be false, but I'm not making it up. <laughs> you can look it up. <laughs> I will <laughs> say this is uh, this is one of my favorite movies, and I actually haven't bought the Blu-ray yet. And I, there's one reason, one reason alone. It, it's still like twenty bucks on Amazon, and there's not one special feature. To no, be found. Nothing, nothing. There's a bare bones disc, and I can't see paying more than about ten bucks for no, it. No, and you're right. That's it which is really a shame. It should never have been priced over ten bucks. It's, it's ridiculous. Re- well, and it's it's just a shame that they didn't. I wish they had taken more time to put some something together. Like well, Johnston was a huge fan of the comic. He obviously just came off Captain America. I can't imagine that it would have taken that much to track him down, sit him down, do an interview. Well, exactly. How much would the guy that would have loved to give a chance to revisit that film and say, look, this is... Or commentary. I, I was pr- he was proud of this film. Yeah, I would love to hear a Joe Johnston commentary for The Rocketeer. Should, I love the fact that Dave Stevens, the comic book writer artist who did the book, loved the movie. I love it when you hear those stories. Where he's like, oh, I don't care how it did in the theater. I mean, I, you know, he does care. He would right, like if there's more. But he was proud of the film. He thought it captured what the, the, the book was about. So. It's got this great art deco thing all the way through it that's really cool. And um, if I could plug something for just a moment, sure, my... Yeah. my uh, my wife has an Etsy shop where she does custom painted Chuck Taylors, uh, and this is it's called Peregrine <coughs> Peregrine like the Falcon Paints, uh, which is the name of the Etsy shop. And she just did a pair of Rocketeer shoes for somebody. They look incredible. Oh, they look like the poster, like the Art Deco poster that Disney put out. I can, I can actually hear fish having a fish gasm right. Right. Now. Yeah. I'll I'll, link, I'll include a link in the comment section if anyone's interested. But I just thought I'd throw that out there. All right. Well, moving ahead, that was of course the Rocketeer. Now we're going to talk about Heavenly Creatures, which finally gets a Blu-ray release. See, as much as you were looking forward to Rocketeer, I was looking forward to Heavenly Creatures, which is go. one of my favorite Peter Jackson films. And naturally, that's saying something because he's Peter Jackson. This is the movie that he didn't do right before Lord of the Rings. In fact, there was a smaller film called Forgotten Silver he did between those. But it is the film that got him the deal to do Lord of the Rings. In fact, I have an ex-girlfriend who will, in fact, attest that when we walked out of seeing Heavenly Creatures, I said, we just saw the guy who should do Lord of the Rings. And yeah, I he wants right. that noted. I want so that I'm, noted. I'm writing it down right now. <laughs> Um, I can't imagine what you saw in it other than, you know, Middle Earth in the wide shots. Well, no, the whole thing was the way that he did these fantasy sequences. Because this film, which was the first movie that he did was that was not just a genre movie, like Dead Alive, which was before this, uh, is based on a real story 
that took place in New Zealand with two girls, two young girls who ended up murdering the mother of one of them. And uh, both these girls were underage and they ended up being the, basically the legal when the, the law said, OK, well, you have to be separated for life. You're never allowed to speak again. Yeah, I've never heard of that before. And that seems really difficult to enforce. But it is what actually happened. And apparently yeah, they strange. never apparently they never have communicated since they live very far away from each other. There was a lot of controversy after the fact as people inevitably tracked them down. Neither one of them happy about that or yeah. the fact this movie was made at all. But he created a really astonishing film, both visually and just plain story. Wise, it was the debut of Kate, a young Kate Winslet, and Melanie Linsky, who you may not know the name as well. But Recently, she was in The Informant. You've seen her in a lot of stuff. You just yeah. didn't realize that you saw She looks her. like a Cusack. She does look like She a looks Cusack. like the lost Cusack. Yeah, exactly. Where it was clear that the male chromosomes work better in that family. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but it's these two girls who end up becoming best friends, who both have suffered from childhood in, uh, illnesses. They're, it's during the 50s. Um, they end up, they both have very different backgrounds, and yet they become so close that it's it's pretty much a lesbian relationship. But that of a young girls so young that they really don't know what they're doing. Close enough to a lesbian relationship that a, a very conservative society sees it as a problem. Right. And they live in this fantasy world that they've created for themselves as they write this story back and, war, back and forth about handsome princes and, and various things that happen in fantasy worlds. That mm-hmm. they've built little clay models of all of them together. I mean, it becomes so all-encompassing that reality itself loses its luster of interest where all they want to do is be around each other and spend time with each other until it's just regardless of having your sympathies with them initially there's no mistake it's a psychosis right and the most interesting parts of the movie are are where that line keeps breaking down between fantasy and reality i think one of my favorite shots in the whole movie is they're building a sandcastle and it the camera is on the beach like you know, panning toward the castle, and then it goes inside, yeah. and it's clearly a set now, but it's still completely made of sand, or at least it looks like it, and has, like, giant <coughs> seashell decorum, and, like, you you really feel, more than anything else, like you've been transported inside a sandcastle, and it's one of those things that i just never seen in a movie before. Yeah. I've never seen them, like, completely and perfectly recreate a sandcastle, and then seamlessly blend the shot so it looks like you've, you've magically changed size, like... It's a really interesting movie. Visually, it's it's striking. Well, so much of it we, we see taking place inside their own imaginations as sure. the way kids will do is they just, they LARP through their fantasy, right. basically. <laughs> and they're... The characters in their fantasy are walking, talking clay figure figurines. That, yeah, that, I think with. that's what's so interesting to me about it visually is the uh, and obviously Peter Jackson's firm Weta and uh, a guy named Richard Taylor is primarily responsible for a lot of these effects and deserves a shit ton of credit for them. But you know, there's this there's this idea that the girls are making these models out of clay, and when you see like these giant moving clay people that are real to them and their imagination is just mind-blowing that, yeah because it's it's not a hugely budgeted film and it's just yeah. really really impressive uh what early early weta was able to create definitely yeah totally love this movie we're gonna move on though just if nothing i could talk about this movie for hours but i that gotta pull myself creatures. back i was heavenly creatures i love that movie so much can't recommend it more how about another movie that finally came out on blu-ray that i also can't recommend more is city of god oh such a great film this film a lot of people just are like i never even heard of that it was nominated for four oscars this is one of incredible film. Yeah, this is one of my favorite films of all time it's uh it was it's from rio de janeiro mm-hmm. and it is a, a elaborate crime thriller mm. about like young people in the slums uh, who build these gangs in a gang war that that popped up and this is all based on a true story too by the way which mm. i didn't realize till i saw this version it's of it. it's got to be based on several true stories because that's one of the most interesting parts about it and when uh when attack the block came out the really trendy thing that people were calling it was super eight mile hmm. and i was like Honestly, I feel like this movie has more in common with City of God than it does either of those movies. In that, I can see that. they actually make the poverty and and the slums its own character. Yeah, and and that's what's great about this movie is it focuses on some characters, but really what it's about is the changing crime dynamic of this area, and it does it in a way that's both beautiful and sad. I mean, the cinematography in this is 
groundbreaking. There's no other way to say it. I mean, and it's not in that sort of like slow atmospheric Roger Deakins sort of way, which like, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying it's a different style. I'm saying it's more in the really fast paced uh, sense of, of something always happening sort of way. Uh, even when nothing's happening, there's always the feeling in this film that you're missing something, that something's about to happen. Yeah. There's a tenseness of things just barely similar. You always feel like you're explode. on the edge of anarchy. Yeah, and you are, shit. And you really are. <laughs> you know? And it follows this kid who just wants to, he doesn't want to be a criminal. He wants to be a photographer, mm -hmm. right? And growing up in the middle of this huge mess where everyone he knows is involved in crime because really... There's just nothing else that's worth doing. Yeah, Everything else yeah. is shit. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not in crime, you're no one. Getting a real job is point. You can't survive on a real job. Uh, and it's an expose of the politics of the and the social situation going on there. In fact, this Blu-ray comes with a really great one-hour documentary about just that, that, hmm. that hasn't been on previous versions, showing, okay, here's the real story, what's going on here. Um one thing I did not know is that every actor in here, except for the white, the French actor who played Carrot, mm -hmm. or the gang they're dealers, not, they weren't actors. Nope, they're they just, were they're real people kids from the slums. From the slums that they pulled out that in That's after what's so auditions, about it put them in an acting camp for a couple months, and then said, "Okay, we're going to do this movie." And you can't believe it because the no, performances it's, they're incredible, oh amazing. All of them are incredible. So great. Yeah, this is if there was a must see film that that you uh, most of you probably haven't even heard of i hate to say this is one of Corey's favorite films i actually gave him a copy of this for christmas oh this yeah year. It's, uh, but blue like i'm i'm with brian this is definitely the film that a film that we can go back to and say this is one of the best films ever made it's, yeah uh, and that sounds absolutely. like hyperbole but it's, it's not it's true it's one of the best films i know i've ever seen it's not hyperbole it's completely true <laughs> Okay, so one last thing, and we're going to have to wrap this up because it's already past our bedtimes. <laughs> uh, and that is the new Showtime series, The Borgias. Now, I've been this has been on my radar for a while because, all right, come on, The Borgias, they're like one of the, like, like what was it you were saying earlier about the Vatican? Oh, yeah, it's it, this, this proposes the really incendiary thought that at one time there was misdeeds going on related to the Catholic Church. What? I know that's hard for us to, to comprehend now that they're so squeaky clean, but at one time, and this was a really fucked up organization. And the Borgias were a family that were, like, not just this generation, but several generations afterwards, involved in some pretty serious and heinous misdeeds in, that, in Rome and that part of the world in general. They're generally associated with the concept of using poison to... Machiavelli your way through success. Yeah. Uh, and this takes place early, kind of early in their dynasty. With uh, It Jer starts in the year 1492, which I only remember because it came up on the screen and that was the same year Columbus discovered America. Well, Jeremy... Sailed the ocean blue, I think, is how the line Oh, goes. that's right. That's right. Yeah, come on, get it straight. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez! <laughs> Why do we even bother alliterating for you Man, if you're not going to remember anything? It is late if I'm getting shit for not remembering a nursery rhyme I was taught in kindergarten. Uh, but Jeremy Irons plays Pope Alexander the Sixth, who is indeed the, uh, the the daddy of of uh, Rodrigo Borgia, who tricks and lies and bribes his way to become the new pope when the old one dies. The old pope already being aware that all, as we see him still alive in the beginning, that all these cardinals around him are a bunch of corrupt, money grubbing douchebags but there's so much corruption he flat out says it on his deathbed i really hope that whichever one of you assholes ends up taking over next that you realize that we kind of fucked this up this is all shit uh including he himself who apparently as we discover had any number of series of bastards and 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 uh mistresses which guess what pope's not supposed to sleep with anybody what this what this movie what movie what this show clearly illustrates for us is how spectacularly our education's failed us our schools failed us in not making this shit interesting in history class there is so much sex and blood and evil and like the first episode has you hooked and then you realize that you can't really spoil anything because if you've read any history <laughs> books you know what's going to happen and yet it's far more interesting to see on a showtime series well no. i mean once again, it's jeremy irons first off who is so great and and he's i, I i'm a huge fan of him and a huge fan in this series i i did get to watch this whole thing fortunately and i can hardly wait for the second season to start if i had a criticism of it 
It's just that sometimes it falls too deeply into who's fucking who type of stuff and soap yeah. opera type elements where I'm much more interested in seeing who's fucking over who, which yeah. is the, you know, I mean, this is the Borgias. I want to see about who's getting murdered. And the most interesting stuff for that is actually happening with his son, C- Cesar, played by Francois Arnaud, who is, uh, he's a, his consigliere in the church, his number two guy, basically. They but, use the same fucking word as the, the tagline. Yeah. The tagline for this series was the world's first crime family. Yes, it is. And uh, awesome. Yeah. He's he doesn't want to be in that position. He wants to be what his wimpier brother is, which is in charge of the military, because he wants to fuck women and he wants to go out and do stuff. But as it goes along, he realizes, oh, you can still do all that stuff here. Just because you're a cardinal doesn't mean you can't fuck people and kill them. You know, uh, (laughs) you can be cardinal sin. And there's this, he has this weird relationship with his sister, Lucrezia, uh, played by Holiday Granger, where it's not incestuous, but it's gonna get Okay, I will say this. I only watched the first couple episodes, but am I wrong, or isn't that name associated with serial murder? Yeah, she was one of the famous poisoners. Okay, I was like, that name sounds... Goddamn well, familiar. At, at least in stories. From every, when I'm read, the actual her actual like history is largely conjecture. Apparently. Well, I remember like, and this is a weird way to remember it, but there's uh, you know those movies about wax figures that come to life and they're yeah. wax figures of killers. There was a bunch made in like the oh, 60s. waxworks. Um, yeah, I think it was actually like horror in the wax museum that I'm thinking uh, of, and they started just listing their cast of of evil wax figures. Yeah. And I remember the name Lucretia Borgia, so I was like, isn't she like a serial murderer? And, 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 uh, yes and no I don't know apparently everything I've been reading says like there's a lot of stuff that's been asserted that she was and a lot of other stuff that's like well to be fair no one really knows right. but so much about her it could have been other people but yeah in the context of the series even though she is the sweet young innocent of the show mm-hmm. by the end of the first season it is clear that she has learned a lot from her family indeed and she literally stops the French from destroying Rome through feminine wiles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is basically true too, apparently. Thanks, vagina. I know, right? Sometimes <laughs> it's useful. <laughs> there, there's a lot of good stuff going on here. You're not actually going to be wow. familiar with a lot of the actors in here, except for maybe there's some people you're like, oh, yes, I um Yeah, I was going to say, Cole Fiore, I think, is a fantastic actor. Yeah. I, was really, I hope he pops up. Well, he's the kind of the villain of the series as much as like every, well, you know, everyone is a villain. Everyone's but, a villain. Yeah. But he He's the, the, the villain to the villains. Uh, he's not a good guy either. He's just as corrupt. He's just pissed he didn't become Pope. So right. he's trying to manipulate the whole civilized world to turn against Rome, basically, throughout the length of the first season. And he's quite good at it. He's, it's a, he's like I said, he's he believes what he's saying is right, but only because he's so wrapped up in how awesome he thinks he is. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff going on. God, there. I love history on TV. Uh, so much holy shit, Emmanuel Shariki is in this. There's there's a lot. She of, is so of, hot. A lot oh of great actors God. coming. There's lots of sex. There's lots of nudity. There's lots of violence. Dude, there's this Emmanuel great guy. Shariki gets naked. I'm in. <laughs> there's a great guy who's an assassin that works for uh, Cesar <laughs> who kills people in the nastiest, bloodiest ways throughout. The Machiavellis are actually characters in here. I keep joking saying I can't describe this plot as Machiavellian because <laughs> the Machiavellis um, show up. They actually show up, so it would be awkward. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, and this this assassin guy, all he's missing is a white hood. Yeah. Like, he's basically the guy from Assassin's Creed. Yeah, right. Who is Batman, by the way. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I don't know if you figured that out. <laughs> that, that guy is Batman. Man, we're just traveling through like a geek rabbit hole right now. <laughs> we totally are. But that's what remote viewing is, isn't it? That is everything that's great about remote viewing. And except for one last thing, we got to wrap it up. Oh. Do you know what that last thing is? Giveaway! Giveaway! Well, you nailed it. We got one last thing in giveaways. We got two things here to give away. First off, I have Vietnam in HD. Now, last month we gave away World War II in HD, which is an absolutely spectacular series using actual footage from that time, a lot of which was unseen until that series, and spending a lot of money to upgrade it to tell that story. Now we've got Vietnam in HD, which naturally was a lot later, and naturally there was a lot more footage to speak of uh, involved with that. And it's... I think the better of the two series, at least to me personally, for the for you know the conceit that it's trying to do there, uh, it's narrated by Michael C. Hall, who of course is Dexter, and it tells the story of 13 different Americans during the Vietnam War using this footage, all voiced over by various well-known actors, uh, Adrian Grenier, Kevin Connolly, Blair Underwood, Tempest Bledsoe, Zachary Levi, James Marsden, Jennifer Love Hewitt, Army Hammer, 
Dylan McDermott, Dean Cain. I mean, it's actually a pretty re respectable group of people that the History Channel got to come on to do these things in the six episodes. And they're really gorgeous looking. Anyway, we've got the Blu-ray of that. And actually, hold on, let me check. I have two Blu-rays of that and a DVD to give away. Cause, so let me know when we do this one, which what's the code word? Apocalypse Now. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> when 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 uh, we go through the rules and you tell me Apocalypse Now, tell me if you prefer the DVD or the Blu-ray, because maybe you're one of those folks out there that doesn't have a Blu-ray player. The other thing I got to give away is this set, and I, I actually really enjoyed this series, despite the fact that it's a little, it's a little silly, it's a little put together in a sort of pop sort of way. It's a neat historical, like, speed course through America. It's America, the story of us, and it, this is... Uh, the Super Set DVD gift set version of it that comes with the entire original 12-part series, a 400-page companion book, and a brand new bonus disc that has a, a new episode called Modern Marvel's The Statue of Liberty on it. And like I said, I, I didn't watch the Statue of Liberty thing. I have not seen that, but it comes with... The, the show itself is super fun and is, you know we all studied this in school those of us in America and I forgot about a lot of this yeah so it was kind of a neat way to refresh it and it's done in a very fast paced almost too fast paced for a serious like it turns out the Machiavellis show. were poisoning the Statue of Liberty and having sex who, with its sister who knew uh, <laughs> what's the code word for that one baseball baseball that's I was actually going to say apple pie so that totally works we'll go with baseball all right, so that's it. Those are the giveaways. That was Remote Viewing Episode 2. What do you think, guys? I thought it was amazing. I must listen. And <laughs> Four stars! Four stars! Two L thumbs up! Lousy bonus features, though. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> For this kind of time that I put into listening to a podcast, I expect something a little extra. Well, that's because the, the bonus features are us. Coming up next week... The commentary for this episode of Remote Viewing. <laughs> Our drunken commentary. <laughs> no, I think that's what the comment pages are for. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I won't look at them. <laughs> oh, we will. I'm It'll a little happen. frightened now. But anyway, thanks so much for joining us. And we'll be back maybe sooner than a month. From what I'm hearing, the powers that be are kind of pleased. So it'd be nice if we could come back sooner and have less time to be sitting here recording absolutely so yeah. listen up listen to the podcast tell your friends spread it around and again as cyrus said thank you so much for listening <laughs>